Major funding for Virginia Currents is provided by Patty and Bill Pusey. Additional support from Friends of Virginia Currents. Coming up on Virginia Currents, it's our worst fear, a gunman opening fire at school, work, or church. We'll show you how to be prepared and how to talk to your children about these incidents. Also, what are some signs that a threat is real? An expert from Randolph-Macon College offers insight. And these furry friends may look cute, but we'll show you how the Richmond Canine Training Center makes them sharp, resilient, and reliable police dogs. Plus, climb aboard the Richmond Railroad Museum and find out why this old train station is a treasure trove of history and fun. And the incredible Trap House jazz music of Masego. All next on Virginia Currents. Welcome to Virginia Currents. I'm Amy Lacey. There have been nearly 300 mass shootings in the United States this year, according to the Gun Violence Archive. They define mass shootings as four or more individuals being shot or killed in the same general time and location. The tally of mass shootings began August 1st, 1966, when a student sniper killed 14 people in 96 minutes from a clock tower on the University of Texas campus. Mass shootings make up a small fraction of all gun deaths, but it's still best to be prepared with a plan and know how to communicate with your children about these incidents. Mike Jones with Major Security Consulting and Design, who's a retired police chief, came to WCVE to show us that it is possible to survive an active shooter situation. The active shooter incident. It's not something anybody ever wants to talk about, but in any business, any school, any place where people gather or work. Good morning, Mike Jones here for the security meeting. All right. You need to think about these things because they happen and they're happening with more frequency. So many people are concerned with the active shooter. So we adjust our security tactics and measures through use of what's called SEPTED or crime prevention through environmental design. Everything from security cameras, from access control with your swipe cards, with locked doors, and you have a, a design of a doorway, which allows for anyone hostile to be kept out. There are so many things behind your desk which you can have, starting with this heavy glass dish. It is very heavy. Which, it's when you're under stress and you've got that adrenaline rush, it's amazing what you can do for that. One thing that we give a lot of people is bug spray, the type that reaches the second floor nest of the house that will not kill a person, but will right. definitely take them out of the action, giving you enough time to escape and call for help. Fire extinguishers, everybody should know how to use those. Uh, what stops the person is when that dust hits you, right. and it, it hurts your eyes. And when you go into that pain response, you really can't even hold your gun. Okay, so I hear shots in the lobby. What's the first thing I should do? First thing you do is go into survival mode. You know it's an active shooter, assume it. So go to your door, shut the door, make sure it's locked, get your uh, doorstop out and put it under. Hopefully you've tested that beforehand and it works. If it doesn't work, then what you need to do is use the bolt slide that hopefully is installed on your door. But you, you do those things first. When you put that bolt slide, then you come back here by your concrete walls and then you wait it out. Okay, so what about the window? Should I break the window? Breaking a window is not as easy as everyone thinks. Mm -hmm. Also use a hammer or anything else like that. But remember when you break the glass, you're gonna attract attention, but usually that is a very last resort measure. I'm on my way to my last panel now. Great, we'll be there in 30 minutes. I'm going to start by showing you a film that was produced by the FBI and it's a reenactment of what an active shooter in a school is really like. I'll see you soon. I love you. Bye. I teach this from the role of a survivor. Sometimes people, when they think of active shooters, they're going to die. No, I'm here to tell you that you're going to live. I call it survive for five. Most of these incidents last from five to eight minutes and then they're over. One of the things that you should keep in mind are three words, run, hide, and fight. Under stress, under pressure, you always resort back to how you're trained. When you talk this out, you understand where you're gonna go, what you're gonna do. Part of the way that you survive is to 
keep you cool by saying, we've done this before, we've, we've trained for this. If you can't run, if the shooter's too close, hide. Now hiding means taking the light off your phone and also silencing. If you cannot silence your phone right away, you need to learn how to do it because light and sound attract predators. If someone would burst in through that door now with a gun, and some of you are gonna run this way, some of you are gonna run that way, when that shooter comes in, that shooter believes that you're just to sit there and die. They're not expecting you to jump up and throw things at them. The overall thing is no matter what you do, do something. And a lady in California who was cleaning up at a church, an active shooter came into the church. She was in a conference room that just had a table and a bunch of trash bags. She got in the bag. She pulled the bag over her head and sat very quietly right beside the other bag of trash. The person came in, looked around, didn't see anything and left. And the moral of that story is, whatever works for the moment. We are aware of the situation. We're currently experiencing a university emergency. One of the most important takeaways from you if you have children and they have phones is that you establish a communication, an emergency communication procedure. We haven't seen Sarah either. <laughs> it's hard to talk to a 12 year old about going to school and having to run to protect themselves. It's hard to see the aftermath for this. We experienced an unthinkable tragedy at our high school this morning. We have 17 confirmed victims. We can confirm multiple fatalities. Because of social media and the coverage of all of these mass shootings, the images which are ubiquitous and really hard to get away from, children are really experiencing a huge number of these incidents coming across their view. So the impact of these cannot be ignored any longer. And we have to begin as a society, as parents, as educators and others, to know how to address these with children. It is very important for children to be able to express their feelings because once the feelings are out, at least then parents know what the child is struggling with. Developmentally, it's very important to keep your child's age in mind. Uh, with a very young child, you do not want to load them with too much information because they do not have the cognitive sophistication to process that information like adults do. With a school-aged child, you really want to know what the kid knows. And once you've heard it from them, um, Really correcting misinformation is very important. Helping them understand that um, there are safe places, that these are incidents which uh, have occurred, but that your job is to really keep them safe and you will make every attempt to do so. You have to be able to look at your own anxiety levels. Children really look at parents for role modeling. So if you're falling apart, the child is more likely to fall apart. On the other hand, if you're able to pull yourself together and keep the household routines going as they should be, uh, it gives children a great deal of strength and sort of a path to follow despite what is happening in the world around them. And very importantly, parents need to reduce the exposure of the child to the information again and again and again, because that itself produces trauma of a different kind. Mom! Oh my God! Oh my God! When you are part and parcel of an event such as this, uh, there's a, there are a lot of things that go on, such as the survivor guilt, where you feel, why wasn't I taken? Why did this happen to my friend? Which can develop into depression uh, as you go along. Anxiety, in which any loud sound can kind of catapult you into that, that period and you may not even know it. And then it produces irritability and anger and it takes a very insightful person to weave the two together. So there are very long-term impacts for people who are actually within the realm of that event. It is all the post-event work that goes on in the way of taking care of your physical injuries, but also taking care of the mental health needs, which come out as what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. And soon the day took a dark turn. I recall my work at the Virginia Tech shooting, where I was the mental health expert for Governor Kane's Blue Ribbon Panel. It has reverberated in my soul 
and my body actually for years and years and even till today I, I recall talking to those individuals like so this is what I would call vicarious traumatization that you don't experience it but you vicariously experience it through the experience of others so you can imagine the impact of it on the people who are on the scene and uh, it has far-reaching public health implications it is still a relatively rare situation it's one that has a high impact because it involves our children but it's there's so many things you can do and the very first thing you can do starts today is thinking about this that's why it's so important for you to develop that plan now take care and get with your, all your family members and say, look, what should we do in the event of an active shooter and you're there? Uh, and there's nothing that will beat you. I can guarantee it that when you get that text that says, Mom, Dad, I'm okay. For more information on Mike's crime prevention consulting business, go to Facebook and search Major Security Consulting and Design. One of the deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history happened in our own backyard. The Virginia Tech massacre claimed the lives of 32 students and faculty members in April 2007. After that tragedy and others across the country, there were rallying cries and questions. Could it have been prevented? And how can we know if someone is a potential shooter? Dr. Denise Bissler, a criminology professor at Randolph-Macon College, is here to offer some insight. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. You often hear these mass shootings lumped together with the mental health debate, but do most of these shooters have a diagnosable mental illness? Uh, in reality, not necessarily. Yeah. So often they don't have a criminal or mental health history. They, in about 50% of the cases, they will. Often depression is linked, but we don't have a clear connection between mass murder and a psychiatric diagnosis. So mental health screenings would often get too many po false positives. They would have, it would look like people would be more likely to commit a mass murder who, would, who never would even become violent, let alone commit a mass murder. Um, often there's, there's not a clear diagnosis or a criminal history either. And looking at all of the shootings, they are all so very different, but there's one similarity that many of them are men. Absolutely, so we don't have a clear profile. These cases are so rare. Often the shooter is dead, either by suicide, or by cop. Um, so we don't get to interview them. So we don't have a great profile. They tend to be almost overwhelmingly male, right? 95% of the cases are, are men, white, um, over the age of 30. In the cases where they do know more of a motive, revenge is often brought up. How can people know if somebody is actually going to act on a threat that's made? So uh, that's the trick, right? Yeah. The prediction is likely impossible in these cases, which isn't what anyone wants to hear, but it is. it would be very difficult to predict. There are some signs, though. There's leakage, something called leakage, and that is the idea that many of them will tell you, will tell someone, or post on social media, or make a video, or a manifesto, that they are planning this attack. And the warning signs are that if you see an attack, or a plan for an attack that is well thought out, they're planning the attack, they're planning an escape, they're stockpiling weapons, they're gathering ammunition, that's really concerning. And calling a hotline in that case would be uh, certainly reasonable, especially if your workplace or your school has a hotline where you can make those calls and have a threat assessment team uh, decide whether it's uh, credible or just sort of someone spouting off or joking. Are there any other signs that people need to look for in a potential shooter? Certainly they tend to be, um, they have a sort of suffer a lifelong of frustration, lifelong sense of failure, and they tend to externalize blame for those failures on other people. And that's where the motive of revenge can come in. They may be, revenge, they may be vengeful towards a certain target that they think wronged them or a certain group of people that they blame for whatever has happened to them. So that's a, a commonality. Um, the, they also tend to be social, socially isolated. Some people argue that they're loners to begin with. Others argue that they become socially isolated because of rejection. Um, bullying has been linked, but that's another thing that is more assumed than uh, something that we really sh see an empirical data-driven link. In fact, many of them were both 
bullied and bullies. So uh, the research is showing that they were both victims and perpetrators of bullying. So again, the link is it's not as much causal as correlated. So many people are bullied or loners or suffer rejection and they will never become violent or mass shooters. So we have to be really careful about prediction and causality. Those things may be themes and they may be one of many motives, but we don't exactly know how they work to whether which ones will become mass murderers and which won't. Well, we know that so many people are talking about this. Thank you for adding to the conversation today. Dr. Denise Bissler. Thank you for having me. Since 1957, dogs have been an important part of the Richmond Police Department. These four-legged officers go through a 12 or 14 week school, depending on their specialty, and have retraining exercises every month they're on the force. I stopped by the units complex on Richmond's north side to see what it takes to get them and then keep them on the streets. Here, here, I'm up. Yeah! <laughs> Woo! The dogs we get are I guess your 99th percentile as far as energy and drive to do things. So you're taking a new dog who has tons of energy, doesn't really even really know what to do with all that energy, and you're molding it into what you want to do with it. And it's, uh, the dogs learn really fast, they do. We make it a game for them, like we get our paycheck at the end of the week, their paycheck is playing with us. So for our drug dogs, we put the odor behind one of these tubes. And early on, it doesn't look very pretty. You're just teaching them, you're kind of tapping as you go along, and you're teaching the dog just to check that hole. And then when they get to the one with the odor, the toy magically appears. Yeah. Because we'll push a towel or a tug from the other side. Nice. So it's like they smell it and also boom, toy comes out. And it's just repetition, repetition, they learn. I find the odor, I get my toy, I get to play. Sweet reward. Yeah, and then, so you just build off that. You don't fully appreciate them until you uh, go through a 12 week school with them and see exactly how good they are and how good they can be at, you know, searching out. We're talking, you know, just little crack rocks that big hidden, you know, in a car somewhere and they'll go right to them where, you know, we would have no chance of ever even sniffing that out. Oh, are you, you ready to work? Come on. Come on. You ready to work? Yeah, come on. Find it. So right now he's in the odor. He's just trying to work it out. Where I was talking about, we get our paycheck at the end of the week. This is his paycheck. Playing tug. So our drug dogs uh, sniff out the five major narcotics, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, methamphetamine. Our patrol dogs, they're your traditional bike trained dogs. So um, they're trained to kind of go after felons essentially in Richmond, uh, they're trained to track. As far as the bomb dog, every time we have a you know special event in Richmond, before and during that event, our bomb dog's out there trying to sniff out, keep us safe, you know, on the outskirts, in, in and around, everywhere. So, you know, sometimes you don't necessarily see everything they do, but, you know, they're out there doing it. Um, you know, if a five-year-old gets lost in the cold somewhere, you know, our bloodhound, we're gonna send him out and try to track him down, you know, keep him safe. So they do a little bit of everything and they do it well. It's all about making it fun for them, play, 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 repetition. We, we wanna keep them happy, having fun. That's when we get the most work out of them. We want our unit to be at the top. You know, we're talking about, we don't want to violate anyone's rights. We don't, you know, we want him 
we want everything at the top of the game and to do that you have a lot of people who put in a lot of extra hours you know behind the scenes and to keep it that way you know, it's very rewarding to work with them the nonprofit Friends of Richmond Canine holds several events a year to raise money for equipment, training, and veterinary care for the dogs. Learn more at rvacanine.com. And check out the unit's online museum, started about 20 years ago by late canine officer Harry Fearson at rpdcaninehistory.com. Virginia Currents is on the move with the Richmond Railroad Museum during its annual train day. Since 2011, the Richmond Railroad Museum has displayed fascinating exhibits of Virginia's rich railroad history. It's based in Manchester's Hull Street Station that was built in 1915 and saw its last passenger train depart in 1957. After that, the building was only used for storage and gradually deteriorated and was damaged by floods. But now, it's a center of education, history, and fun that beckons conductors at heart to climb aboard. There's a train deep in the station. I think every child, every man who was a child, has had a, a love for trains at one point in their life. And, uh, I will say I'm one of those uh, kids who love the good old choo-choo train. The Richmond Railroad Museum is right across from Shaco Slip on 14th Street Bridge, and a lot of people, you know, it's a gem they haven't found yet. For one thing, it's a lot of fun here. We have a lot of exhibits, uh, both uh, young and older folks, to see. This is the place where we show off our stuff. We've got full-size railroad cars. We've got model railroads. How old is this train? I don't know. Ask the, you can ask the guy back there. This train station was built over 100 years ago to serve the Southern Railway. And about 15 years ago became a full-time museum full of great artifacts that represent all the railroads that served Richmond throughout time. There's really five or six major ones, and we have something from each one of them here. We're about uh, using our heritage and our culture uh, to attract tourism. And today, I guarantee you there are some Richmonders here, but there's some folks who don't live in the city of Richmond who today have chosen out to come out and enjoy uh, what Richmond has to offer. And that is a great history. This is our second annual train day. It's kind of our gift to Richmond. It's free admission to the museum, and we add a whole bunch of other stuff for the kids. Sometimes people will say, I didn't even know Richmond had a railroad museum. So that's one of the reasons we really like to have this day, is to introduce ourselves. The last train left here in Manchester in 1957. Yet, a number of you are here just to enjoy what this area has to offer. I think people who come here will see the, the various things that uh, made uh, Richmond in this area uh, a thriving community. And this was all part of it. This is where a lot of it began, right here. You can ride the rails on a vintage train for a three hour excursion that's filled with amazing views of the James River. Go to richmondrailroadmuseum.org for more details. This week's Spotlight on Virginia Music shines on the pioneer of Trap House Jazz, Masego. If you've never heard of Trap House Jazz, you're not alone. It's a mixture of soul, jazz, dance music, R&B, and hip hop created by Masego. This musical mixologist grew up in Newport News and was mentored by 1990s hip hop legend DJ Jazzy Jeff. Masego also credits 1930s Harlem great Cab Calloway as his guiding spirit. This saxophone player, singer, rapper, and DJ has been featured on NPR and in Vogue magazine. Here now is a clip from his full-length album, Lady Lady. Thanks for watching Virginia Currents. Join us next time for more inspiring stories. I'm Amy Lacey. Shout out real quick. Yeah, yeah, touch it. I feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it. I know.
know she want me, she want me, she want me. Say, say, I can feel it, feel it, we feel it, we feel it. I know she want me, she want me, she want me. Say, I say, I can feel it, feel it, we feel it, we feel it. I know she want me, she want me, she want me. Say, I say, I can feel it, feel it, we feel it, we feel it. I know she want me, she want me, she want me. Say, I say, I can feel it, she feel it, she feel it, we feel it. I know she want me, she want me, she want me. Say, I say, I can feel it, she feel it, she feel it, we feel it. I know she want me, she want me, she want me. Say, I say, I can feel it, she feel it, she feel it, we feel it. I know she want me, she want me, she want me. Say, I say, I can feel it, she feel it, she feel it. She want me, she want me, she want me. Major funding for Virginia Currents is provided by Patty and Bill Pusey. Additional support from Friends of Virginia Currents.